The focus will be to give you sort of a flavor of, of how a municipal water utility is um, approaching this issue of climate change. And I think to build off a comment that Nick said, and to paraphrase Tip O'Neill, all impacts are local in a way. Um, all politics are local. And, and I think here part of the, imp the puzzle is how to figure out the implications of a global phenomena at a very small localized scale. Uh, I direct the climate change program at or climate resiliency group at Seattle Public Utilities. We're a regional water provider, uh, storm and wastewater utilities, as well as a solid waste utility. We're not a power utility that's handled by Seattle City Light. And so I'm uh, responsible for, tr for trying to figure out the implications of this issue and what to do about it for Seattle. Some key concepts, which I think you've probably already, already covered, but why are we talking about water and climate change? Well, the IPCC, in a paper they released in 2007, notes that, in, from their opinion, um, water and the impacts of climate change and water may be the primary pressure, pressure point for society under climate change that has implications for water quality, water availability, water infrastructure, and there's big gaps in what we know. A key concept which Janet sort of alluded to in her presentation is this notion of stationarity is dead. And it's a little wonky, but uh, it stems from a, a seminal article from 2008 that Chris Milley wrote, um, Stationarity is Dead, Weather Water Management. The notion is, of stationarity is that uh, the water system, water cycle, operates within an envelope of variability. And that envelope of variability provides some degree of predictability. And that's a, a tenet upon which the water sector has, has based a lot of its planning and its decision making. That we can, we can rely on this envelope of variability as we plan out 20, 30, 40, 50 years in time. Climate change introduces the notion that that variability, that envelope is gonna be sort of blown apart and therefore um, undermines sort of a basic tenet for the water sector as we look forward in time. A another key concept is the notion of vulnerability and a couple of points I just want to make here is that a change in climate does not necessarily equate to a vulnerability. You really have to understand the implications of that change in a given space, a given locale, and for a given system. And vulnerability is really a function of um, exposure. So to what degree is your system exposed to this given change? Denver is not very concerned about sea level rise, right? They're, they do, they're not exposed, at least directly, to the impl uh, implications of sea level rise. Sensitivity is how, how does your system, as it's exposed to something, how, what is its response to that exposure? And then adaptive capacity is the ability to essentially manage um, and affect that exposure and that sensitivity. So, Vulnerability is a very dynamic um, characteristic. It's not fixed, and it's something that you can adjust. You can through enhancing your adaptive capacity. So this is really a call for folks like my agency and, and me and others, and an invitation to think about how can, what can we do to enhance our adaptive capacity and to reduce our vulnerability and make sure that the essential services we provide are, are there going forward in time. So um, again, wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor of how a municipal water utility is approaching this issue. And I, I think, Janet, you're right that uh, in the water sector, uh, I, there are a lot of cities that are putting a fair amount of energy into this issue. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later. In Seattle, we, I work off sort of six kind of themes or objectives. One is we need to embrace and engage the science. You know, we can't hide from it. Um, we need to engage it, and not only that, we need to figure out how to tailor it so that it speaks to the specific needs that Seattle has and that Seattle Water Utility has. In doing that, we need to assess our impacts and our vulnerabilities, and part of that is the exposure and sensitivity, but what can we do to enhance our adaptive capacity so that we can reduce our vulnerability? Building collaborative partnerships is um, instrumental 
to engage in the science, working with uh, the research community. We've worked closely with Laura Whitley Binder in the past and are currently working closely with Oregon State and the University of Idaho. <clears throat> also working closely with uh, other water utilities. Strengthening institutions and people is, is really critical for building adaptive capacity. I've hired a meteorologist into my group who is um, spending a lot of time trying to enhance our operational capacity and, and using forecasts. And, and weather tools to increase our knowledge base. And then all of this is critical and, and hopefully leads to embedding this into our decision-making processes. Uh, my agency is, has an $800 million capital and operating budget, roughly annual budget, um, 1,400 employees. And so not all of that money that we spend on the behalf of our citizens has a climate angle to it, but we need to make sure that as we're investing in infrastructure that we're considering how climate change may affect the functionality of that infrastructure, you know, 40, 50, 60 years out in the future. And then thinking very uh, comprehensively and, and developing a portfolio approach so that um, our approach is not just about uh, necessarily building infrastructure, but can we think about policy levers or legal levers, um, behavioral mechanisms. We sell products to people, we sell water to people. How can we look again at across the suite of solutions and find the optimal mix to enhance our um, adaptive capacity? So just some examples from those objectives. This is a group called the Water Utility Climate Alliance. Um, I think some of you may know about it. I know Brett, you've, you definitely know about them. A group of 10 large urban water utilities that collectively we serve 43 million people in the US. Seattle's the current chair of the group, includes most of the large cities in the, in the West, <clears throat> but also New York City and Tampa are um, Eastern. So we have a West Coast bias here. It's not an East Coast bias, we have a West Coast bias. And the focus of WUCA is how we pronounce the acronym, is sort of twofold. Um, there's a lot of Star Wars jokes uh, in there. <clears throat> um, you should come to some of our annual meetings. We tend to dress up as uh, Star Wars characters. <clears throat> um, it's sort of twofold. One is, how can we improve the usefulness of climate science and make sure that the scientific research enterprise, which has been focused primarily on basic science, can also sort of evolve to address the applied science needs of, of folks like us, of folks like Seattle and Denver and New York. <clears throat> and then also on the management side, looking at how can we improve our decision-making processes so that we're um, evolving in our sophistication and figuring out how to use um, science in our decision-making processes. So it's sort of a two-fold focus. We also have some efforts underway now to look at climate resiliency across multiple sectors. So we're working with the insurance sector, energy sector, public health sector, and um, sort of the engineering sector to see how um, the vulnerabilities in one sector can ca cascade across multiple sectors. How can we collectively think about those issues and, and address um, vulnerabilities in a comprehensive way? So it's been a really important group for um, certainly for Seattle, but for the water sector, a place where we can enhance our knowledge base, share best practices, and learn from each other, as well as amplify our collective voice. So assessing impacts. This is a, a results of an old study um, from 2007. And just to cut to the chase, it, what we did is we used climate data from the AR four report, so I think Dennis talked about the AR5 report that's going to be coming out here shortly. Um, we use three different climate scenarios and these bars represent, um, but let's look at 2050. So this bar at 94 percent, that represents, that means that under this scenario, this GIS ER V1, uh, we would see a reduction in our supply of 6 percent and that, that loss of supply ranges from 6 to 21%. These hash boxes represent some adaptation options we could deploy, and the number represents how much additional supply 
those adaptation options would, would buy back for us. So in two out of three scenarios, we identified adaptation options that could restore our supply completely. Now, we are in the, in the throes of using the same data that the IPCC is using that we obtained with, through a project with Oregon State and the University of Idaho. We're, we're gonna be using 28 scenarios. So going from three to 28, giving a much more full um, look, an expansive look at the potential impacts. And we'll be hopefully having uh, some of that data available by the end of the year, potentially. But even so, this is all really fuzzy, right? <laughs> um, so it's not Lincoln or George Washington. Um, maybe this will be our president in like 2300 or something. <clears throat> we'll all be governed by Excel you know, charts. Um, even with 28 scenarios, it's still very um, fuzzy stuff, right? Going from models that operate at a global scale that break up the earth into grid boxes that are 200 kilometers on the side to working at, uh, in a watershed that's a sliver of that, you know, the watersheds that we operate in, is, you know, that's, uh, uh, there's, there's some loss, loss of translation, loss, a little bit of loss in translation here. So we, we don't refer to these as predictions, we call them projections, and, but it's better than nothing, right? It gives us a sense of how our system could function under plausible conditions, but we have to recognize that you know, there are a lot of black swans out there, right? Not only that, this looks at just hydrology. So Seattle, we're interested in, and, and in terms of supply, but we're also curious about impacts on water quality, uh, frequency and extent of forest fires, uh, temp water temperatures, impacts on algal blooms. Um, we have a habitat conservation plan uh, on our Cedar River water supply, as well as a uh, in-stream flow agreement with the Muckleshoot Indian Tribe in perpetuity for um, managing flows on the Cedar River. So we have multiple interests, and so this is just a, a slice of that, but again, it's better than we, where we were five, ten years ago. And it also helps us be able to articulate our understanding of the impacts on the system that we're responsible for. Another realm where this is playing out is the meteorologist I mentioned that I hired in my group is looking at storm events of, of significance in Seattle over the past 30 years and is identifying the type of storm it was. Was it a convective event? Was it a frontal passage? Was it an atmospheric river? How many, what was the duration? What was the rainfall? How many, what was the call volumes associated with that? How many CSO events did we have? Um, how many backups? Uh, what percentage, what was the volume of CSOs? And so starting to try and build a localized climatology that associates different basins, different watersheds, different neighborhoods, uh, and what their sensitivity is to different storm events. We're coupling that with um, much more enhanced forecasting capability so that we just had a, a pretty heavy rain event. Um, based on our knowledge of what's happened in the past, we're starting to look to say, well, Here's how sensitive different cities are, different neighborhoods are to, to this type of storm event. And it begins to give us a sense and some degree of forecasting ability to say, here's what we think the impacts will be. More importantly, we're starting to drive that into our operations so that we can deploy crews to certain parts of the city to be better prepared based on our knowledge of what's occurred in the past. Combined sewer overflow. So it's when um, untreated raw sewage mixed with stormwater is uh, discharged into a water body. In this case, Elliott Bay, Lake Washington, or Lake Union. <clears throat> sea level rise, not um, of direct interest, or maybe of interest, but not on topic for this workshop, but we're also going through and taking the best available science. This is from the National Research Council report looking at sea level rise on the West Coast and identifying different parts of the city that would be inundated. Uh, we have an inventory of our assets that are gonna be inundated at different time slices and starting to look at, well, what are the implications of that inundation for um, our service delivery? So mainstreaming. Um, the wide-eyed radicals at the World Economic Forum um, uh, do an annual survey where they assess global risk. This year, they identified climate change as one of them and they note that a climate smart mindset incorporates 
climate change analysis into at the strategic level and at the operational level. So, you know, this is not, um, climate change is not the realm of, um, you know, left-leaning radicals, uh, people who want to control um, how people act. Maybe the, maybe the World Economic Forum wants to control how people act, but these are um, cold-blooded business people who have recognized that this is an issue that needs to be factored in into what they do because it presents risks. Another set of uh, wild-eyed radicals, McKinsey Company, wrote a report a couple of years ago, the Economics of Climate Adaptation Working Group report, and they looked at uh, adaptation options that sort of span, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a portfolio of approaches, infrastructure, technological, behavioral, financial. So we're seeing at, at certain aspects of society, um, maybe independent of, uh, of Congress, that are recognizing that this is uh, a real issue that needs to be dealt with and factored into what we do. So we're trying to do that here in Seattle. Um, this is a chart from a UK document looking at asset management and climate change. And it does a nice job, I think, of uh, illustrating that when you build something, um, it, it has an expected life, right? And that expected life can vary <coughs> depending upon the asset class, even within an asset class. But what they did, they did is they took sort of general life expectancies of different asset classes and then overlaid that with the expected changes in sea level rise, temperature, <clears throat> precip in the UK. And it starts to show that if you're gonna build a, a bridge today, that bridge is gonna be subject to most likely dramatically different set of conditions um, over the course of its life. So it's incumbent upon you to consider that. And what you do with it is, is in the realm of decision making and, and what your risk tolerance is, but you at least need to consider it. So what we're trying to do in Seattle is we have a, um, a process called stage gates where our large capital projects have to go through, and so I, I kind of consider it like a, um, you have to show your papers at the border. To pass through these, these sort of metaphorical gates, a project has to show it has all its, work, its papers in working order. We're trying to embed a consideration of climate change into that so that as we're building something that's gonna live, have an expected asset life of 60 to 100 years, that we're also considering the different set of conditions that that asset's gonna be exposed to to ensure that we can continue to provide services. And it may mean that you adjust something today as you're building that, but it may also mean that you decide, I'm not gonna spend the money today, I'm gonna wait 20 or 30 years, but I'm gonna create options for whoever is going to be there in 20, 30 years so that they can take action then and spend the money later and not now and, not, um, and have essentially an asset that maybe is overbuilt and isn't really needed to be that size for 20 or 30 years. So um, this is something that's very ripe in the uh, water sector. And if you ever see some of those report cards that come out that assesses the state of the nation's infrastructure and they say there's a, like a you know, $900 billion price tag, Important to think about, does that price tag reflect a climate consideration or not? And what would the additional marginal amount be if we wanted to bring our country's infrastructure up to snuff um, so that it's also prepared for, for the impacts of climate change? So that's, I think, somewhat representative of what some of us in the water sector are dealing with um, as we try and take, again, this issue that has often described in sort of global scales and bring it home and, and figure out what it means for the services we provide and <clears throat> what sort of strategies we want to pursue to make sure that those services are continued to be provided. Thank you.